I'm going to continue that series, although not quite the theme uh, today, but I, I'm going to turn firstly to 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Uh, I've been reading uh, actually this, the life of David recently, and uh, David has an interesting journey. He becomes this young man who is called by God, anointed by God, slays Goliath, becomes commander of the armies. God, God produces lots of victories wherever he goes. And then he gets hounded out of town by the king, King Saul, who um, is jealous of him. And he ends up living in the wilderness and in, uh, in a place of, 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 as an outlaw for a number of years. And during that season, a bunch of people join him. Uh, people who are in distress and in debt and uh, people who are outlawed and people who are in trouble and people who have nowhere else to go. And uh, there's a transformation that occurs in these, these people. They become, later on, the Bible uh, describes them as David's mighty men. They do incredible exploits for the Lord um, because God is with them. My, my favorite, I think, is Benaiah, who... who uh, um, uh, kills a, a lion with his bare hands in a pit on a snowy day. <laughs> I like that. If that, was, if, that, if that was said of me when I died, uh, he was a mighty man. He killed a lion with his bare hands in a pit on a snowy day. I, I mean, if it hadn't been snowing, it would have been easy. But the fact that it was snowing <laughs> just makes it just that much more, more powerful. But these are David's mighty men. Anyway, uh, this season comes, and after the Battle of Gilboa, King Saul is defeated, and David becomes king in Hebron over the, the people of Judah. And then, uh, gradually, there's this season where the rest of the tribes gather, and their mighty men and their armies, they gather, and they're like, you know, David is, is not that bad a guy, really, after all, and we really need a king, and we should go down to Hebron, and we should pledge loyalty, loyalty to him and ask him to be king over the whole nation. And they come to him, the divisions of all the armed troops came to David, at, to David at Hebron to turn the kingdom, it says in 1 Chronicles 12, to turn the kingdom over to him according to the word of the Lord. And I'm going to pick up, I think, in verse 30, it says, of the Ephraimites there were 20,800 men, mighty men of valor, famous men in their father's houses. Uh, of the half-tribe of Manasseh, there were 18,000 who were especially, expressly named to come and make David king. Of Issachar, men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. 200 chiefs and all their kinsmen, kinsmen under their command. Of Zebulun, 50,000 seasoned troops equipped for battle with all the weapons of war to help David with singleness of purpose. And it continues. I like the, the descriptions, mighty people, people of valor, uh, people who are well known in their, their father's houses, people who had a singleness of purpose, and the sons of I Issachar who understood the times and knew exactly what Israel needed to do. People of, of, of valor, people of might, people of singleness of purpose, and people who understood the days in which they lived. It's one of the challenges for us as God's people, isn't it? To have a singleness of purpose, to, to have arms that are strengthened with the courage that comes from knowing who our God is and what he's called us to do, and a singleness of purpose to follow him in the generation in which we live. And to understand the days, to discern the times. Jesus picks up on this, actually, in um, Matthew chapter 16. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they came to him to test him, to ask him for a sign from heaven, the Bible says. And, and he answered them, and he said, when it's evening, you say it will be fair weather, because the sky is red. In the morning, you say it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. And I feel that that's uh, words that Jesus could as, just as much say to us as he says to everybody around us. There are things taking place in the world all around us that demand our attention, that demand our, our, our careful prayer, our intercession, but our attention, to pay attention to what is unfolding on the earth. What, what signs, what times? Well, Jesus speaks about it himself in Matthew 24. He's asked this question over and over again. You know what the disciples say, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And he describes a whole litany of things, earthquakes, famines, wars, rumors of wars, and you know, all kinds of troubles. 
And he says these things will happen, but the end isn't, isn't connected to them. They're, they're kind of like birth pangs. They're kind of like contractions. Contractions taking place on the earth. This description of, a, of birth pangs goes all throughout the New Testament scriptures. In fact, Paul picks up on it in Romans chapter 8. And I, I apologize, you don't have notes today because I, I changed what I was going to do today. Um, but I will, hopefully, if you write carefully, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some, some references and if you want to follow along. Romans 8, verse 18, Paul says this, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole of creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. This description of the whole earth is like pregnant with something. That the, 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 the troubles and the... And the the machinations of the earth, whether they're, they're wars or famines or, or earthquakes or rumors of wars, are all part of that, that grand intensification of the events unfolding on earth to point us to the revelation of what it is that Jesus wants to reveal in us and to us. It says this, that, that we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we also groan inwardly, Paul says, as we eagerly await the adoption of sons, the redemption of of our bodies, for in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he has seen? But we hope in what we do not see, and we wait for it with patience. We are living according to a different kind of reality. We are having a hope and expectation of something that has not yet been revealed on planet Earth, that God is getting ready to shake things. He's getting ready to move things. He's getting ready to open the eyes of the blind and shine light into the darkness and shake our complacency and wake us up to the reality that Jesus demands from us a response and that Jesus is getting ready to return. When, I don't know. How, exactly, I don't know how it's all going to unfold. But when you see these things happen, Jesus said, look up, pay attention. And this is a season, this is a moment in our lives where we have to continue to pay attention. Last week we celebrated outside. I hope some of you were able to join us. We had a wonderful outdoor celebration for the festival in conjunction with the, the, the biblical festival of Sukkot or Tabernacles, the biblical feast. It's a feast of joy and uh, celebration connected with the Lord's promise to preserve his people. The one who leads you through the wilderness, he says, you know, as I led you through the wilderness, when you come into the promised land and you build permanent homes and permanent houses for yourself, remember that I was faithful to you in the wilderness, that, that I'm able to keep you in the land of promise. And it's a promise that's commanded to the Jewish people in, uh, I believe, Deuteronomy 16, Leviticus 23, a few, few scriptures, that they're commanded to keep and to observe the, the Feast of Tabernacles for all their generations. That three times a year, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, the, the Jewish men are to appear before the Lord, present themselves before the Lord as a living sacrifice, observe and worship Him, recognize Him, honor Him. And, and we see this, this happening throughout biblical history. And so for us, last week, we were able to gather outside in, in the open air and, in, in a sense, our tabernacles. And we were able to celebrate the joy that the Lord who leads us through the wilderness of our wanderings is able to bring us to a place of permanence. Yesterday, the, the, the eighth day, of the festival. It's known as Simcha Torah. It's the celebration of the word. It's the celebration of God's faithfulness in the wilderness. And then it ends with the great culmination, the great final, uh, actually, sequence of festivals at the end of Tabernacles. The Hoshana Rabbah, the, the, great, the great Hosanna, the, the, the big praise, the day of big praise and celebration leads into Simcha Torah, which is the celebration of God's word, where, where throughout Throughout the land of Israel, the Jewish people would, would wander through the streets worshiping and praising God for the, for the gift of his word, lifting up the scrolls up to heaven and thanking God that he has revealed his character, he's revealed his faithfulness to all humanity through his word throughout all 
generations. Yesterday was a Shabbat, uh, so it was also a particularly high holiday because it fell on a Shabbat. And at about 6.30 in the morning, uh, Israel was invaded from about 20 to 30 different places along its southern border with the Gaza Strip. I didn't bring maps for you today. Some of you, you can, you're sensible people, you can look it up, those of you who, <laughs> who know. Um, but I, it's, a, it's a pretty precarious uh, stretch part of the world. Um, uh, armored trucks filled with uh, Hamas-trained and equipped uh, jihadists, suicide jihadists on a suicide mission. Um, many, many dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of armored vehicles uh, came under the cover of these dawn rocket raids. 5,000 rockets were fired about 6.30 in the morning, uh, impacting almost half the population of the land. Uh, they came with aerial gliders and boats and rockets, and it was a sophisticated, coordinated, uh, and a fairly unprecedented military-grade attack. Well-funded and backed by Iran. You're not, you're not going to hear this on CNN. But uh, I remember when I lived in Israel in the Second Lebanon War, um, we had friends who were out there in, in the, you know, fighting in the, the southern part of Lebanon, trying to take back land and trying to sort of uh, push back the Hezbollah. And uh, they would tell me, that they, and that is there. subsequently I've been up, visited some of the naval, the army bases up there and, and the, the fingers of the Naphtali, the, 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 ridge, the ridge lines that... that to the highland between Israel and Lebanon. And they've all said the same thing. The soldiers we were fighting spoke Farsi and were wearing the uniforms of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. The media would, would because and it's not because the media is all evil, they're just ignorant and a little bit stupid. You've got 25 year olds writing your news headlines. I mean, no disrespect to you, young adults, but, <laughs> but, but they haven't really been around long enough to really understand the context of much of what they... I mean, I worked around newsrooms when I was 25, and believe me, no one knew what they were doing. Um, so, so, I mean, no disrespect to, to the profession, the, the honorable professional in journalism, but, but the reality is the media wants to keep the story really, really, really simple because your eyeballs are only going to be on it for about 15 seconds. And so they try and keep it as simple as they possibly can. And it's not simple. Uh, the conflict unfolding before our eyes in the Middle East has nothing to do with a particular, a particular group of disenfranchised people. It has everything to do with the entire Middle East. It's everything to do with what's going on in Saudi Arabia. Everything to do with Iran's conflict with Saudi Arabia. Everything to do with Iran going nuclear. Everything to do with the hostage crisis that we, America, you know, gave released $6 billion to Iran just a few weeks ago uh, in exchange for some American hostages. And, and then, lo and behold, Israeli hostages, over 100 Israelis, men, women, and children, were taken hostage yesterday and taken into Gaza. There's a whole lot more, more going on than meets the eye. And whenever you see these things unfold in the Middle East, it, it, it causes a little bit of distress. There's over 350 people at least uh, killed, many, many bodies lying dead in the street. And some of you may have seen the so the pictures, people killed with rocket attacks by, by gun attacks. There was a big, uh, over a couple of thousand people were wounded uh, seriously. There was a large um, rave going on actually in the desert. Um, a bunch of Israeli young people out there doing a kind of burning man type thing in the middle of the night. Not very religious and probably not very God honoring, but that's what they were doing. And these, these armed trucks just came in and started mowing these kids down. Uh, mass. Each one of these events was a mass, casu mass casualty event. Uh, and for, for a nation the size of Israel, this whole thing amounts to something far more significant for them as a nation than even 9-11 was for us. And uh, we have to re recognize that, acknowledge that. But bad things happen in the world. It's not just the, the killing of people in their homes on the streets. I mean, hearing reports from you know, second, third-hand reports from people that are known to us and people that we know of terrorists in their house holding them up hostage at gunpoint. I mean, in Israel, everybody is connected. Everybody's got a friend, a brother, a son, a daughter, or, or an uncle who is currently serving. Every male under the age of 45 has been drafted right now and mobilized. Uh, this is, the, the entire nation is impacted uh, by this. And many of the, the, the people that we support, whether it's uh, the people in the Shai Fund or Solu, or our friend uh, Salim up in Nazareth, who was texting me this morning, an Israeli Arab pastor up there asking us to pray. Um, 
it's interesting, even the ongoing gun battles this morning on the roads and with some of these enclaves, these people who broke in. This, this is significant. It's, it's interesting that Israel, <laughs> when it, the Israelis on their side of the border are having parties and planting vineyards and planting, planting farms and all that kind of stuff, and, and on the other side of the, of the separation fence, uh, Hamas is building tunnels and militarizing civilians and, and sending rockets. And uh, there is a very stark reality that you can't reason with this. You can't necessarily um, uh, just wish this would go away. It's a great a practical prayer for the nation of Israel right now that they would discern the times in which they live and know what they should do. There is no easy solution to this. There's no easy response for this. The, the fact that there's news this morning of uh, the formation of a unity government, I think is kind of welcome, but I'm not as engaged. There's been a political gridlock in Israel for as long as I remember. And uh, it's interesting that sometimes it takes a, an existential threat like this to, to, to get the parties to start talking to each other and start engaging. There's three things I want to spend the balance of our time this morning describing this morning to you, and that is why should you care? Just because it leads, it bleeds, you know, it bleeds, it leads. It's, just because it's on the news media and on the social media and just because it's leading doesn't actually mean it's significant. Not everything that the media is pumping out every day matters or, or is significant to, to the world. But why do I think this is significant for us as Christians today? There's three uh, things, if you're taking notes, I'm going to address today. Israel's calling, Israel's conflict, and uh, Israel's confidence. We care because we, we've lived there. Michael and Abby have spent a lot of time there. People in our, people in our congregation have visited there. We know people there. Um, we, we, we care about these people. We care about this land. But it's not just because it's any other conflict. There's, a, there's, there's something that, that of the nature of God that is, that is contained in, in the events unfolding in the Middle East. And I don't have a, a time to unpack this history today, but I want you to turn with me to Psalm 83. Psalm 83 begins this way. O oh God, do not keep silence. Do not hold your peace or be still, O oh God, for behold, your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have raised their heads. They lay crafty plans against your people. They consult together against your treasured ones. They say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. It's an interesting that the psalmist would write that because uh, some things in life just don't change. There's some truths that uh, are true, were true in the, in the Old Testament times, they were true in the New Testament times, they were true in the medieval times, they were true in modern times. Some things don't change. Why? Well, because the God of history decided that he was going to bring about redemption of humanity through one man. In Genesis chapter 12, we meet him, he's called Abraham. He said, Abraham, Abraham, he called him out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a covenant with you. I'm going to make a, a solemn agreement with you that in you all the nations of the world will be blessed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to enable you supernaturally to give birth to a son that you can't do on your own. And through that birth, I'm going to give birth to something in the world, a people in the world that are going to become for me the incubator, the custodian, the vehicle through which I'm going to deliver redemption for all humanity. He called Abraham to, 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 to birth a people and that people to have a land in which God could demonstrate his character to the nations. That's really what most of this book is about. In fact, the entire Old Testament is the story of God's faithfulness to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and Moses and, and David and, and uh, the, the testimony of the prophets, uh, Isaiah and, and Jeremiah and, and Ezekiel and, and Zechariah and, and the, 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 the testimony of Israel's wandering and their failing and their, and their, their times of, of, of renewal and their times of rejection of the purposes of God. You see, their journey is an awful lot like my journey. It's an awful lot like your journey. When things are going great, I forget the Lord and I just carry on and have fun. 
And when things are going, uh, are going a little bit more difficult for me, then I start hitting, hitting the floor and praying a lot more. Am I the only one who does that? Like trouble in life does improve your prayer life. Did you realize that? When, when, th- when things are going great, we have this tendency, we read it all through the Old Testament, we have a tendency to forget God and take him for granted and take his blessings for granted. But when suddenly the rockets are flying, we start hitting our knees and praying. There's no atheist in a foxhole. That, you know, it's very hard to not believe in God when, when, when you're being bombarded from every side. And so there's a mystery inherent in the call of God, a mystery that God chose a, a man, and through that man chose a family, and through that family chose a nation, and through that nation chose to reveal himself to the world. Uh, Paul describes it this way in Romans chapter 3. He's asking this question. He's actually been asked this question by the church in Rome. You know, what advantage has the Jew, or what value has circumcision? If, if we're all saved by grace through faith, if there's neither Jew nor Greek, if there's neither slave nor free, if we're all the same before the cross of Jesus Christ, what's the point of the Jewish people? Who gives a rip whether they're blowing each other up in Gaza? Truthfully. Well, well, Paul says, yeah, much in every way, because, because to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were found unfaithfulness? Does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? He says again in Romans 9, he picks up exactly the same he picked up the same thing. What is the point? What, what, what is the purpose of the, of the Jewish people? They are the Israelites. To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. We worship a Jewish Messiah. We read a Jewish book. We are grafted into a Jewish faith. So what significance is it to us as Christians? We have nothing if it is not for this, for this, for this Bible and, and, and the journeys of the people whose stories make up its pages. And so we have a, Paul says, we have a debt. We have a debt of gratitude. We have a debt of gratitude to this people, not because they're any more righteous, not because they're any more loved, but because the role they have played in human history has brought us to a place where we can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, the part of this, this call given to Abraham, this birthing call, is very much like uh, uh, the way that we, even in society, we care for people who are pregnant. We care for people. If, you, if, 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 a, if a pregnant woman is killed by a drunk driver in a car crash, it's a double homicide. Why? Because there's something in her that, is, that has value beyond her, irrespective of what the abortion advocates say. And so there's a, uh, there's a, there's a reality. Like if, if you, you know, one of two of your daughters come for Thanksgiving to your house and one of them is nine months pregnant, and, or eight and a half months pregnant, and the other one isn't. You know, who are you going to pull the chair for? Who are you going to fuss over? Who are you going to sit down? Who are you going to make sure they put their feet up? Who are you going to serve food to? You're not going to expect your eight and a half month pregnant daughter-in-law in or daughter to cook the food, to serve the food, to do the dishes, to do the like. You're going to actually care for it. Why? Because she's carrying something that's bigger than her. That she, she, is, she has become the vehicle of something that is a blessing for you and her family and their family. That's why we take care of those who, who are with young, those who have young children. Every society, every ethical society cares for families and cares for those who have young. Why is that? Not because they're any more loved, not because that one daughter is more loved by you, but she's pregnant and in a sense, the picture of the pregnant woman is the picture the Bible gives us as the nation of Israel. We read about it in Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 12, we get this incredible picture of it. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet and a head on her head, a crown of 12 stars. And she was pregnant. And she was crying out in the birth pangs and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down the third of the stars, and of heaven he cast them down to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child. 
one who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but his, her child was caught up to God. It's a very, very powerful picture. It's a very powerful, misunderstood, but very powerful, and actually, I think, quite clear picture. The woman is Israel, pregnant with the Messiah. And the dragon wants to eradicate the name of Jesus, the work of Jesus, the testimony of Jesus, and his word in the earth. He, his, his trick has not changed. From the Garden of Eden till now, this red dragon wants to annihilate those that carry the name of God those that speak of God's faithfulness, those that attest to his, his enduring covenants, his enduring word, and his enduring purposes on the earth. And so you see God's love for the Jewish people is connected to their role their role in being the custodians of the oracles of God, the the possessors of the covenant, the ones who have preserved for us the testimony of Scripture, the one whose journey has taught us the character and the love and the care of God, so that when Jesus walks on the shores of the Galilee, he can actually refer back to a history. It is written, and they know what he's talking about. There's a context for the coming of Messiah. Not only did they have a call to birth, birth into, into existence, the, the great salvation of all nations, but they have another more difficult part of that call is the great high priestly nation that is called to offer up on the cross the death of their own Messiah on behalf of the world. As a high priest will take the, the, the innocent, spotless lamb and slaughter it on the altar, that its blood would be shed, that the the guilty would be saved by the death of the innocent. So the Jewish people, the high priestly nation, was called to offer up the innocent lamb of God on behalf of the sins of the world, which is why Jesus hanging on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because what they did, they did according to the foreordained mystery of God that pagans like you and I, who are wandering around in kilts, eating berries, that we might come into a recognition of the God of heaven. This is the beautiful reality of the gospel. We have a debt to this people, even though, as Paul describes in Romans 11, they are enemies of the gospel. It's an amazing statement Paul makes in Romans 11. He said, they're enemies of the gospel. They have rejected their Messiah. They're enemies of the gospel. Everywhere Paul went, he was persecuted by his Jewish brothers and sisters. But he loved his Jewish brothers and sisters because he said, they're beloved on account of the fathers. They're beloved enemies. They may be enemies of the gospel. They may be opposed to the purposes of God. They may not even believe in the purposes of God. But God loves them because he set his name upon them and this nation, which is why Psalm 83 says, the enemies of God seek above all to eradicate the nation of Israel from the face of the earth. Because if they can do that, they make God a liar, they make his word untrue, and they make your salvation of no effect. Because if God will not fulfill his promises to Israel, how do you know he's able to fulfill his promises to you? So why should we care? About a few dozen Israelis being killed, uh, been taken hostage, and a few hundred Israelis being killed on the edge of the Gaza Strip because it's not about them. It's about God's purposes for the world. That's the call of Israel, her conflict, the nature of her conflict. And here's the challenge of, of Israel's call. They, they have been, after 2,000 years of exile and wandering, this people was preserved through pogrom and persecution and inquisition, and finally through the Holocaust, a systematic plan of which most of Europe was in agreement with and participating in to eradicate 13 million men, women, and children just a a generation ago in the ovens of Auschwitz and the killing fields of, of, of Eastern Europe. 
And God rescued and preserved this people from even that and brought them back to the land against the will of the nations, against the tide of history. He reestablished them back in the nation of Israel exactly as his prophets had foretold in Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37, Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 32, and Amos 9, in Isaiah 11. I could go on and on and on and on. The restoration of the Jewish people to the nation of Israel is the single most prophesied event in human history. Your Bible is filled with it. And God will not break his word. Though the sun may fall from the sky and the moon may disappear, though the earth may shake, God will not break his word to his covenant people. That's what Jeremiah says. This is like the waters of Noah to me. As I promised that the, the flood waters of the earth will no longer flood, never again flood the whole earth again. I will not allow the, 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 the light of my people Israel to be extinguished from, from the earth. So when the enemies of God rise up and they say in the parliament of Tehran that Israel will be wiped off the map, and they fund terror attacks designed for the very purpose of doing that very thing. We need to pay attention. This is not an ethnic conflict. It is not a territorial conflict. It is a spiritual conflict. And we need to discern the days in which we live. We need to understand the times in which we live. And here is Israel. They, they're witnesses to the greatest miracle, really, in their entire collective history in the last 60 to 70 years. And yet they're still a nation in unbelief. They're, they're a nation of great innovation, but they trust in their own resources, a lot like us. That they seek peace, but they're always subjected to war. They, they are set apart from God. It says in the Numbers chapter 23 that the inescapable nature, but Balaam's prophecy over them, that the inescapable nature of the Jewish journey is that they are a people dwelling alone. They're never going to be accepted in the family of the nations, like, like, like the, the Scots might be or the Irish might be. I mean... Or the English might be occasionally if we behave, um, but but they are, but but but, they, but there's something about the Israels, the Israelis, the, the Jewish people. They've always been separated. They've always been isolated. They've always been they're set apart from God. But their one thing they yearn for is the acceptance of the nation. They just want people to love them and leave them alone, like any anyone would want. And yet here is the challenge of their, of their conflict. There's, there's two things I want you to grab hold of today. Two great uh, spiritual um, forces that are at work in the earth through which will help you, the lens through which will help you understand the conflict unfolding before our eyes. This conflict is important. Why? Because it's not just a tiny regional conflict. It has the potential to explode throughout the Middle East. It has the, expense, the potential to globalize very quickly. So it does affect our lives in material ways, but it affects us much more significantly in spiritual ways. There's two principalities that have been opposed to the, the nation of Israel and the people of God in the church of Jesus Christ throughout all history. They, they're two principalities, but they share the same name. It's really interesting. The Bible in the New Testament, John gives them a name. He says it's the spirit of Antichrist. Many Antichrists have come. And we know the great antichrists of history, the great antichrists of history, um, because the Bible describes who they are. That the, the thing that holds them together, the thing that characterizes them, is their hatred of the Jewish people and their desire to wipe them off the map. And there is a spirit that is at work in the world that wants to eradicate the nation of Israel. It says in Psalm 83, and wipe them off, cut them off as a nation never to be remembered again. And where does that phrase come from? Well, the spirit of Antichrist has two, like a coin, it has two sides. The first is very obvious, it's a spirit of destruction. A spirit that would seek, anti to means to stand against. If I'm against something, I'm anti something. It stands, it opposes Christ, it's very overt, it's very, it's very upfront, it's very outward. It's, it's like the red dragon seeking to devour the woman and her, her man-child. It's what we saw in, throughout history with the pogroms and the persecutions and the violence subjected to the Jewish people. It's what we saw with the rise of Nazism in Germany and the, and the, and the final solution and the Holocaust of the Jewish people. It's very overt. It's very clear. You know, the Jewish people have learned that when crazy megalomaniac dictators in 
in other countries stand up in their parliaments and say, I want to wipe Israel off the map. I want to eradicate every man, woman, and Jewish child in the world. The Israelis have learned to take that seriously. They, they, to take it seriously when Hitler said it and to take it seriously when Iran says it and is pursuing the nuclear means by which to affect that very thing that they've set themselves about. And so these are, these are serious issues, this, this outward nature of destruction, and we see it rising uh, throughout the, the 20th century, the jihad against Israel, the holy war, uh, the eradication of the Jewish people. The faces change, uh, the, the, the personalities change, Al-Qaeda gives way to ISIS, you know, whether it's Islamic Jihad or whether it's Hamas or it's Fatah or whatever. But the objective of those who are in sync with this spirit is the same, that they would wipe Israel from the face of the earth. But why is it making such inroads in the West? Why are we in the West so unable to, to stand against it or even to understand it or comprehend it? Well, because the other side of the coin, there's another side of this spirit of Antichrist that's at work. See, there's a second meaning to Antichrist. It means to stand against something. To be anti-something means to stand against something. But it also means to stand in place of something. There's a spirit that is seeking to oppose the purposes of God in a very outward way. And there's a spirit that's seeking to replace and to, in a very subtle and a very deceiving way, to get us to accept another gospel and another Christ. And the church of Jesus Christ in the world is so, is so caught up in a spirit of deception that we don't understand how to interpret the spirit of destruction that's at work in other places in the world. And it's that spirit of dece deception that it also comes with the spirit of Antichrist. And Paul in 2 Thessalonians 11, he says they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And therefore, this reason God sends them a great delusion. Throughout the writings of Timothy and, and his writings to the church in Thessalonica, Paul warns over and over again. We see Peter warn about it in his epistles over and over again that in the last days, fierce times are coming. Times when people will heap up for themselves teachers that tell them what they want to hear and so are deceived because they don't love the truth. They don't care about the truth. They just want to be happy. And unfortunately, the church in the West is unable to see what's going on and unfolding in the world with clear eyes because we're so deceived by our comforts and our convenience and all that's going on in the world all around us. The spirit of this age is a spirit of antichrist. It's offering you another Christ. It's offering you a, a, a Christ that, that doesn't really have to die and doesn't even really have to make you take up your own cross and won't really cost you anything and won't really mean anything. And it enables you to do everything you would have otherwise always wanted to do and just kind of come to church once in a while and put a Band-Aid over it and say that's nice. And that's the problem for us. This, this is, this in, this, this, the, 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 the lure of secular humanism, the spirit that has overtaken our world here in the West, is a lure that, that teaches us to, to compromise. And its goal is to affirm, uh, is to undermine Christian belief, and actually in Israel to affirm Jewish unbelief. And so you see these twin things, even in the nation of Israel, a very secular humanist nation that is deceived about who God is, and it's under assault by those that hate the name of God. They're, they're, they're facing it on, on both sides of the equation. And so we, we see these, the, the, these two forces this, in this conflict. We see these two battlegrounds. The seen conflict that's unfolding in the Middle East uh, this, this, this plan to destroy Israel through jihad that has been going on in different iterations for, for ever since the nation of Israel was established in 1948. And within days, seven surrounding armies invaded that young nation filled with the Holocaust survivors and sought to eradicate it and wipe it off his map. 1967, uh, Nasser of Egypt said, I'm going to drive the Jews into the sea and wipe them off the map. I mean, it, they've been saying the same thing. Nothing has changed. The Hamas charter, the Hamas charter, Hamas that is currently funded by the U.S. government, um, the Hamas charter is committed to the destruction and eradication of all Jewish people in the land of Israel and has never changed. They don't tell you that on CNN. 
Why? Because it sort of wrecks your kind of cycle of violence narrative that, that, that sort of makes sense for people who've got 20 seconds and then they want to go out and eat dinner. And so there's this seen conflict unfolding in the, in the Middle East, but there's this unseen conflict that's unfolding in the West. We do not wrestle, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. If, if, if the conflict in the Middle East is between, you know, Islam and the God of the Bible, if you like, you know, the jihad that's going on, that's unfolding in Israel right now, the conflict in the West is between man and God. It's the complicity of the nations. We don't like the idea of God being in charge of our world, which takes me back to Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth, they set themselves against the, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed one, his Messiah, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords away from us. You see, at the heart of the Western world's great struggle in the generation which we live, we don't want to obey God. We don't want to follow his laws. And we don't, it's not that we don't believe in God. You'll find very few atheists around anymore. We just don't like him. We don't think he's got a right to tell us what to do. And if we want to follow an alphabet suit of nonsense in our gender ideologies, we will do that and no God or no Bible will tell us what to do. That's the spirit of Antichrist at work in our nation, in our world. The nations are raging. Why? Because they want to topple the, topple the reality that the God in heaven is still the Lord of the earth and he one day will come again to judge the living and the dead and call us to account for what we've done with our lives. He, verse four, who sits in heaven of Psalm two says, he who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. He will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury saying, as for me, I've set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. God has laid down a challenge to the nations of the world. I am going to put my son on a throne on the hill in Jerusalem. Come get him if you want. You see, there is a conflict unfolding in the earth. It's actually got nothing to do with land. It's got nothing to do with oil. It's got nothing to do with money. It's got nothing to do with water. It's got everything to do with the person and work of Jesus Christ. And it's unfolding in the earth as we speak. And those of us who have eyes to see need to pray like those who have eyes to see. Understand that the conflict of the nation is, God's, is Satan's purpose to eradicate God's promised seed on the earth. To, 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 to somehow wipe out any remnant or any, or any reminder of God's sovereign will. It's to, it's to prevent them as a people coming to a place of belief and repentance to God. We read in Zechariah earlier this summer that this day will come when God will pour out a spirit of grace and supplication upon unbelieving Israel in the land of Israel, and they will see the one that they have pierced, and they will cry out to him, and what will they say? Baruch haba, Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Exactly the same thing that Jesus told them they would say. He said to Jerusalem as he wept over the city, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who murder the prophets, you slaughter those who sent to you, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba Shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord has brought the Jewish people back to the nation of Israel, not because they're perfect, not because they're holy, not because he loves them any more than he loves you and me, but in order that their eyes may be opened, that they may see their Messiah, Jesus, for who he is and they may cry out to him in desperation lord would you come and he will come and his feet will stand on the mount of olives and he will rule the nations you see we as christians have always believed in the return of jesus christ except in the last five minutes any orthodox expression of Christianity throughout the last 2,000 years has always had part of its creed that he's coming again, he's coming again, he's coming again. And we now live in a generation, because we have an iPhone, we don't want Jesus to come again because we're having too much fun. I'm serious. 
But Jesus is coming again. He's brought the Jewish people back to the land in order that he might finally fulfill that last great prophesied event, bring them to a knowledge and a revelation of his love for them so that he may return and he may reconcile all things to himself. All creation, Paul says in Romans 8, is groaning waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. And, and, and this is the hope. This is the hope that we have. This is the thing in which we hope. God's purpose is that he may bring about in this final unfolding of the last chapters of human history, bring about an awareness across the nations that he is God and he is Lord, and he calls all men everywhere to be saved and come to a knowledge of his great love and goodness. So when the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 24, what will be the sign of your return? He speaks about earthquakes, and he speaks about wars, and he speaks about famines, and he speaks about antichrist, and he speaks about all kinds of things. And he says, finally, and this gospel will be preached in every nation, and then the end will come. And so as we see the conflict, as we see the birth pangs, as we see things get, get harder and harder, and we, we feel the pressure of the season in which we live, we recognize, he says, look up and know your redemption draws near. Know that this gospel is going to go forth to every nation. That I am doing these things so the world might recognize that I'm king, that I'm Lord that I have reestablished my people in the land of Israel, that the world will know I'm faithful to my word, the God whose promise is faithful. And he's faithful in your life. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. What does this mean to us? Well, our response is, unfortunately, whether we like it or not, our, our destiny is tied as people of God with that of the people of Israel. It's tied because we serve the same God. It's tied because we follow the same word. It's tied because his promises to them are his promises to us. And if he breaks his promises to them, how do we know he's able to keep his promises to us? And so we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Why? Because we're commanded. We're not pray, commanded to pray for the peace of New York or D.C. or London or Paris. It's good to pray for peace in those places, but we're not commanded, but we are, as people of God, commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem because God said he's going to set his king upon his hill. He's established for himself a capital city. He's established for himself a place from which he's going to rule the world, by which he's going to make his, himself known to the nations of the world. And it happens to be that little bit of, bit of dirt in between Turkey and Iraq. I mean, that's just, that's just where he chose to do it. And so we want to join him, and we want to participate with him, and we want to pray for those, those, those people who are caught up in the midst of it, and we want to recognize the two things that we most struggle with. There's a spirit of destruction that's at work in this nation to destroy families, to destroy people's view of themselves, their view of God their concept of how God made them, their identity, a destruction of their hope, a destruction of their, of their well-being, a destruction of their mental health. There is a spirit of destruction at work, even in the church, seeking to, to kill and to steal and destroy God's people. We wrestle not against against um, flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. There is a war going on. If you haven't noticed it, there's a war going on. And it's time for us to put on our army boots and recognize there's a spiritual warfare in the earth. We've got to resist the devil and he will flee from us. There's, the devil is looking, the enemy of God is looking to destroy some of your families and some of your children and some of your marriages and some of your lives. And we will not succumb to that. We will resist him. We will stand together. There's not just a spirit of destruction. There's a spirit of deception that is work in the church. It's telling us, as, as the Satan did in the Garden of Eden, has God really said? 
And if God really said it, did he really mean it? You know, twisting the word of God, changing the word of God. Well, the things it says in black and white, they're not really in black and white and they don't really mean what God said. It's, it, you know, if someone's selling something, they're selling something. But the word of God is true, it's plain, it's simple, it's easy to understand. Do not be deceived in this generation. Matthew 24, over and over again, Jesus says, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. There's a spirit of deception that is seeking to take out people of faith in this nation. And there's a spirit of destruction that is seeking to come and destroy our families. And we as the people of God are going to withstand. And we're going to stand strong. Having done all to stand, stand therefore with your, your belt girt, with, the, with the, the belt of truth and your helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and your shoes shod with the preparation of the gospel of, of peace, with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Heavenly Father, would you come? Would you enable us as your people to put on the full armor of God, to stand against the schemes of the devil in our generation? We rebuke the enemy and he will flee from us. We resist him. Spirits of addiction and depression. Lord, the, the, the conflict and the destruction that is at work in our children's lives, in their minds and in our families, we rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Lord, would you forgive us for failing to stand on your word, for stand for your truth, to stand with the armor of God upon us. We're in a war, Lord. Forgive us for pretending as though, as though it's all peace and easy when it's not peace and easy. Lord, help us to stand and withstand in the evil day against the spirit of destruction and we stand against the spirit of deception that is working through this, that through our media, that's working through the church, that's working through, through society, that is deceiving and deceiving and deceiving those who are vulnerable and those who do not know the Lord. We, we stand on the word that you, prom you promised to Daniel that those who know their God will be strong and will do exploits. We thank you, Father, the great sign of your coming is the gospel going forth through your people to the ends of the earth. Make us a gospel-centered people, a truth-centered people, a spirit-filled people, a people able to withstand in the evil day. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem today. We stand on our feet together and we just say we're going to lift up our brothers and sisters in the land of Israel. And we're going to cry out, Lord, would you move in power? Would you deliver those who are held captive? Would you comfort for those who are mourning and would you give wisdom to those who are trying to bring peace and, and, and trying to bring a resolution to, to, the, to, the, to the attacks of the enemy, the attacks of their enemies that have, have filled that nation right now. We thank you, Father, that the one who watches over Israel doesn't slumber or sleep, and the one who watches over us doesn't slumber or sleep. We trust you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We worship you, Lord, in this place today. In Jesus' name.